much, Gail. We love the song too. We love all of the recommendations that you all made for the playlist. I hope that you've been enjoying it over the past few days. Um, and welcome, we have people from far and wide, Texas, and I saw Las Vegas and North Carolina. So welcome, it's awesome to uh, virtually see you all. And uh, before we get started, I wanted to just go over a few housekeeping items. Uh, by the way, my name is Ashley Singleton and I am one of the project managers at Intec. And before we get started, I want to say as a disclaimer that this session is offered by the National Training and Technical Assistance Center for Child, Youth, and Family Mental Health, or NTAC for short, and funded by the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA. And all of the views that our presenters, um, all the views that our presenters have today are not official views of the U.S. government. And yes, this session is being recorded and will be posted on our website and social media platforms after today. So you can come back and listen as often as you like. Uh, in case of any security issues, we will end the session and send a separate email with information on how to rejoin, but knock on wood, if you have wood around you, hopefully that will not happen today. Um, Again, we are INTAC and we welcome you to this space. Um, this is intended to be an interactive session. So please, please, we want you and encourage you to drop your questions and comments in the chat throughout today's session. Um, there will be opportunities to reflect and engage with the panelists and with one another. So we hope that you really lean into this time that we have together and let's make uh, this an action-oriented and solutions-driven opportunity today. Um, you can also engage with us and continue to engage with us beyond today's session. At NTAC, we provide free training and technical assistance services to a wide variety of individuals and organizations that share our mission and our goal. So if you ever have a moment that you've needed support or that you've needed resources, or maybe you just need someone to be a thought partner with you um, to help think through challenges and solutions, please, please do not hesitate to reach out to NTAC. Um, you can see on the next slide, we have a website where you can contact us directly to submit a TA request. You can also um, sign up for our newsletter so you never miss another opportunity and you won't miss any future opportunities to engage with us. Um, I also want to give a huge, big, big thank you to our partners for today's session, uh, the National Family Support Technical Assistance Center, Credible Messengers, and the Youth Advocate Program. We encourage you to please visit their website so you can learn more about the services and programs that they offer. Um, and so with that being said, I am going to pass the mic over to our co-director, Tracy Levins. And again, thank you all so much for being here today. Good morning and good afternoon. Thank you all so much for being here today. We recognize that your time is valuable and we are delighted and grateful that you have chosen to share it with us today. As Ashley said, my name is Tracy Levins. I'm the co-director for INTAC. And we are here today to amplify and lift up the voices, strengths, and leadership of young people who have experienced involvement with the justice system. Across the country, we have seen a gradual increase in the recognition of the importance of bringing the voices of persons with lived experience into the rooms where decisions are made. Sometimes we've seen organizations use surveys or focus groups of young people to inform their work. Sometimes they bring in young people who are a success story to share their experience. Sometimes organizations hire young people to be peer support providers or youth coordinators or enter into other positions of leadership. But we all know it's not just about surveying young people. It's not just about bringing their input in. It's not enough to ask them to share their opinions and it's certainly not enough to parade them around the room as if their success is our success. I'll be introducing Evelyn Clark in just a minute, but something that she's written is so powerful of an introduction to this topic that I really wanna just quote her. 
In her article titled, We Need More Than Youth Voice, We Need Action, and I'll put that link in the chat in just a few minutes. But Evelyn wrote, if an organization truly desires the authentic voices of young people with lived experiences in juvenile justice systems, young people must be given the opportunity and freedom to speak authentically and without fear of retaliation. This means that providers must become comfortable with being uncomfortable and hearing things they don't like, disagree with, or may not fully understand. It also requires being aware of personal privilege, releasing power dynamics, and redistributing power. It's impossible to truly transform systems without authentic and culturally diverse voices, input, and participation at all leadership levels by those who have been impacted by the systems. She goes on to ask us, how can the juvenile justice systems be redesigned to not only hold young people accountable, but also to ensure that they are redirected in ways that support them to be the best versions of themselves? How can the system better support young people with histories of significant trauma who have committed crimes in receiving effective and consistent mental health treatment? How can we make sure that the justice systems are safe environments for true and culturally responsive healing can occur? We know that peer support programs in the youth justice system is one component of that safe environment that Evelyn was talking about. Now this five part series that we're engaging on today and that we're kicking off is gonna really help establish the foundation of not only the importance of youth leadership and the power of lived experience, but we're gonna address racial trauma and racial disparities in the juvenile justice systems across the nation. This series is designed for leaders in the system of care, and we want participants to engage justice-involved youth in advocacy work, to prioritize culturally responsive care for BIPOC youth, and we really wanna help deepen and implement effective peer support programs in each and every system. Now, as Ashley said, we did not design this series to educate you or just to raise your awareness so that you could listen while you're multitasking. We really want you to take this information and, and think about it and wrestle with it and use it to inform your actions. We wanna be able to help transform each and every system, community, state, tribal nation, territory across the country to really benefit young people. So this series, as I said, is the brainchild of Evelyn Clark. It is now my honor and pleasure to introduce you to Evelyn. She is a certified peer counselor from Washington and works as a change consultant and a racial equity trainer at Change Matrix, one of INTAC's organizational partners. Her passions for this work include leadership development and ending racial disparities for BIPOC. She believes that community is the answer for people to get the best quality of services. Her work truly models nothing about us without us. It speaks to including the community and the ones we're serving in all that we do. She has experience at the community, the state government and international levels. Both her lived experience and her work experience drive her heart and her why for this work. She has been able to break stigma for those involved in the juvenile justice and criminal justice systems and other systems, including foster care, homelessness and substance use. Evelyn brings heart, empathy, vulnerability, transparency to her work, really underscoring her work as an effective, courageous, and daring leader. Without further delay, it is my honor to introduce you to Evelyn Clark. Evelyn? Hi, thank you so much, Tracy. That was so kind. Thank you so much for being here, everybody. This truly means a lot. Um, as Tracy men mentioned, this work this series really comes from my heart. Um, this is for all the young people that I've served over the years, um, all the young people that have faced injustices from this system and before this system. So I am truly excited for all of you to be here and to just really, as Tracy mentioned, we want action. Um, so often we, we see you know, these survivors of the system come on to these webinars and we'll grab our tissues and we'll hear a sad story, but then we'll leave and nothing changes. And so we just hope that you can all commit to making that change for all of the young people across the nation.
So we have an exciting day for you today. First, we're going to watch the documentary that was done by the Evergreen State College here in Washington State, Go Greeners. And I believe that we do have some Greeners on the call. So if you are here, wave your hands. I can't see you, but wave your hands anyway. <laughs> And then we'll go into a discussion Q&A. So this will really be a conversation between our three amazing presenters today. And then we're gonna go into solutions um, because as we mentioned, we need solutions. So I'm going to introduce the video today. This video again is done by the Evergreen State College here in Washington State. This program, the Gateways program, provides the approach needed to re-engage youth who are incarcerated in learning and community. Their focus on culture, helping all students learn from their own and respecting others, is critical to breaking the cycle of incarceration, violence, and recidivism. So in this video, um, it's going to talk about, um, again, the young people here who are located at Green Hill School in Chehalis, Washington. You will hear from them um, how they are doing in this system and they will talk about the, the issues that led them up to being in this system. All right, let's get it. Don't just assume because like people are in prison that they're bad people. That's not right. A lot of people are here to further themselves. Meet me, talk to me. I'm not that monster that you think I am. We forget about people and we hold them off and we put them in cages, we put them in boxes or we give them labels and then we treat them like they're less than. Just being compassionate is how everything can shift for everybody. The United States incarcerates more of its own people than any other country in the world. And on any given day, nearly 60,000 of those people are incarcerated youth. We also have the highest recidivism rate. Recidivism is the likelihood at which a formerly incarcerated person will reoffend. In the US, if you're an adult and you've been to prison once, there is a 76% chance that you'll go back. And for young people, that rate can be even higher. Many discuss the need for a solution to young people being stuck in this cycle, but oftentimes the young people that they're trying to help are left out of the conversation. This season of Gateways, join me in hearing from young men who have firsthand experience in the prison system and find out how one program is helping to pull youth out of this cycle. First, I'm visiting a group home for incarcerated youth to speak with two young men who are finishing their sentences there. So how long have you been in this one? Um for like about a month now. Okay, so you wanna show us your room? Yeah, yeah. Sweet. My name's Jose, I'm 19 years old and I was 15 years old when I first got incarcerated. Do you sleep on the top or the bottom? My bed's up there, but at night I pull it down here because I have a fear of heights. So like I'm afraid <laughs> to roll off the top. Okay, that's <laughs> <Yeah>. fair. <laughs> so I sleep on the ground. Yeah, yeah. oh my gosh. So growing up, um, we were poor, we lived in poverty. Obviously went to the food banks, had EBT cards, all that. Um, living with my mom, it was a, it was a struggle because like her boyfriend was um, always spending the money. He was a, a gambler. That's kind of why I resorted to start making money, you know, because I wanted to, like I hated seeing my family struggle. Like I hated seeing them, you know, struggling every month just to make ends meet, you know? And like it hurt me to see him go into food banks and stuff like that. Like that really got to me. We're trying to get in so we could play like baseball or something. Mm. Play sports. Yeah, other than basketball. Yeah, but no, it's nice here. My name is Khalil. I am 19 years old. I was 16 when I went to Green Hill. That's every award that I have gotten. What? This is all awards you've gotten? Green Hill Student of the Month. The financial thing, that's the key. That's what really makes the majority of us do our crimes, really is due to lack of funds. How do you think you can pull kids out of that? 
Because I feel like so many people are just so caught up in it and lost in it, and you can't see, like you said, like you can't see past your street or your block. I guess funding our communities and helping like kids that don't got, like just say clothes or don't yeah. have food or don't have something, and help them so they won't feel obligated to go in the streets and do what they do. That's usually what it is. People trying to take care of their parents, trying to take care of themselves, who yeah. end up doing the robberies, who's end up shooting each other over, you know, trying to get money and stuff. It's just, you're talking about a cycle, you know? It's like if someone's born poor, it's not like you're a kid, you can't bring yourself out of poverty. Right, and if your you parents can. are poor, you're gonna be poor. And so you're gonna, they're trying to make ends meet and then you're gonna have to try and make ends meet. And it's right. just- We can never catch up. Yeah, cause you're starting off so far behind. Right. When I was sitting in my cell, I remember I was giving my court documents. Like, I was hearing stories about other people who had the same exact charge as me. Like, the same kid who had the same charge, he ended up getting like 44 years for it. And then I was tripping because when I saw my court papers, it said I could receive life imprisonment plus a $500,000 fine. And you were 15? Yeah, I was 15. Many youth at the Touchstone group home were previously incarcerated at Green Hill a juvenile detention facility in Chehalis, Washington. So first, can I ask you to like introduce yourself? My name is Aaron. I'm Deontay Moore Lyons. My name is Jacob Carmichael. My name is Michael. I'm 19 years old. I'm 18. I'm currently 20 years old. I'm 18, and when I first got locked up, I was 14. I was 15 years old when I got incarcerated. Did you come straight to Green Hill? No. Where did you go? I was in a, I was in my juvenile. Were you waiting on your sentence? When you yeah. Were? Okay. My juvenile. Can you I explain that? Because a lot of people don't know that like, people spend a lot of time just waiting to get their sentence. Mm -hmm. So for my court process, I had to wait there for almost like two and a half years. They would keep you in your cell for 23 hours a day. You'd come out for an hour. You'd get your shower, and then you could play cards with one of the um, COs or whatever. It was just like an isolated unit. You didn't get to talk to anybody unless you were talking about yourself. Sometimes I'd be in there for 23 hours, except for when I went to school, I was in my room for 22 hours. That was just to find out what my sentence was, and there was like other processes that I went through, like a declination hearing. A declination hearing is when you go before a judge and your lawyer and your prosecutor and maybe a couple of doctors, they tell you that you have been doing adult things, and so you are seen as an adult which that doesn't make any sense because your brain isn't fully developed till you're 25. So how can a 14, 15 year old be seen as an adult? And so if the court so chooses, then they can automatically charge you as an adult. So in court, I have to say is like one of the scariest things I've been through. And I was 14, so it was like, I didn't have any knowledge of court in any way, shape or form. I actually cried inside the decline hearing just because like under the table, they have like six questions they have to ask themselves and they take votes. One of the questions, the only one I remember was like, is he a risk to the community? And he was like, yes. How did it feel for him to say that you were a risk to the community? Okay, so when he said that, That's in my 14 year old mind, <laughs> yeah. I was like, what? <laughs> I try to forget it just because like, nothing good came out of court for me. I was the last one who actually had a declination hearing. And afterwards they were just like, you know what, if you're 15 and you commit a crime that is really violent and we think that you're an adult, we're just gonna auto-decline you. How does that feel to be 16 years old and sentenced with an adult adult sentence? It made me feel like, like this is real, this is real life, this is not a game. I'm getting sent to a county for a grown man. Did you feel really supported by your family before you got locked up? I think my family always supported me, but the thing that got in the way between us was pretty much myself and just my actions. Uh, I've been locked up for Almost four years, it'll be the fourth year this year. I kind of feel bad about myself because like, when my parents don't come visit me, I'm like, why don't you guys come visit me? And then like, I look at people who don't get a visit for years. Like whenever my family visits now, I'm just like, this is a blessing because a lot of people don't get that type of family support. What's your mom like? What's her name? My mom's Deanna Moore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's she's perfect. I, I love her dearly. She comes up here to see me, so sometimes she come up here and water eyes, so it make me feel kind of, you know, bad. But... <clears throat> Are you named after her? Yeah. <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's like, after. sounds familiar. Yeah, Deontay, Deanna, yeah. What's the hardest part about being away from your family for so long? Just knowing that, you know, they come to visit me every two weeks, and uh, they just, no matter what I do, they still love me. Yeah. Yeah. 
That's really special. It means a lot. We make mistakes when we're young. I don't think that we should have to deal with our mistakes until we're like 50 and getting now. Some people are locked up from when they're kids until they're 50 years old. And by then, it's already almost like too late to really try to do anything. Your life is gone. It only takes one to two years to rehabilitate yourself, honestly. Yeah. I would probably define rehabilitation as just like something you would have to do for yourself. I don't think staff from either of the facilities that I was in really was like, OK, I'm going to help you, and you're going to be successful one day. Because I'm locked up, it's like anybody that works here can talk to me however they want. And so they do talk to me however they want. I think part of the reason why staff are kind of like making it hard for residents here is because staff crew here isn't really that diverse. I want a council that looks like me, you know, that has yeah. been through the same things I've been through. So that's a real tight bond. It's just a different type of feeling. We need more yeah. counselors that, you know, diverse. That represent you and yeah. you feel reflected in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you could have access to anything to help you be more prepared to get out, what would you ask for? I'd be more mentors, like just more people who have been through it. I feel like that's the, like one of the only things that can really prepare me for when I get out. Do you feel ready? No, no, honestly. <laughs> so what's it like now that you're not in Green Hill anymore? What's that transition like? It started off rocky because, you know, I'm doing three years at Green Hill. Mm -hmm. Then, like, with no warning at all, I just got released out of it. Yeah. And it was the most weirdest thing. When I first came to the group home, um, I started tripping out. Like I had like this, um, almost like an anxiety attack. Like when I first got on a computer or like, you know, held a phone or whatever, like it was just like, yeah, like I felt out of, like out of the norm, just like lost. Like, Why? Just because it was really unfamiliar? Yeah, like how much technology upgraded compared to when I was on the outs, like before I got locked up. Are there any moments where you've been like in public or just like, like was anything really shocking to you? My first day out, I went to a store and I almost lost my mind because it was just too much and then too much people and stuff. So like the first time I went to the mall, like I did have an anxiety attack because like I saw so many people and like so many things going on around me, like it just, didn't feel normal to me. So we actually ended up having to leave so that way I can like pull myself back together. All the guys we've heard from so far are connected through Gateways, a program that brings together Evergreen State College students and incarcerated youth to learn alongside each other in a college class and through mentorship opportunities. Talib Williams is the current director of the program. It's tough to give a 14 year old no freedom and then at 19, you're like, here you go, enjoy life. They didn't have any social connection with the free world at all. Recidivism <laughs> comes into play when you don't give any incarcerated individual the transition that they need to slowly re-enter a free world. Right? And you also don't give them the tools that they need to survive in the free world. The premise of Gateways can work in any capacity. It's just about giving people a chance. These guys are still at a point where we can do something that'll have a lasting impact. It allows like for the greatest educational opportunity probably ever. In that classroom setting, we were free. Hey, thanks for watching. To hear more about this program that's helped so many guys like Aaron and Deontay and Jose, you can click the link here. And if you remember Gateways from season one and you want to help it continue, you can click the link in the description to donate. Donations collected through the Evergreen State College Foundation help to support the future of Gateways. Don't just assume because... All right, thank you, Joanne. So before I introduce today's panelists, um, I wanted to take a moment to ground ourselves. Um, ground ourselves from the video we just watched. And also I want to read this quote before we begin. Sorry, I hear some background noise. 
Um, I would like you to think about the young people that you have worked with or currently work with as we ground ourselves. Our youth are not failing the system. The system is failing our youth. Ironically, the very youth who are being treated the worst are the young people who are going to lead us out of this nightmare. Rachel Jackson. I wanted to begin with that because one of our panelists today is that young person. Erin Toliafoa was featured in the documentary we just watched. So Erin so is an advocate and leader for justice reform. Erin is the Coalition for Juvenile Justice Emerging Leaders Chair and has helped change laws in Washington State regarding the justice system. Erin currently resides at Green Hill School in Chehalis, Washington. He models leadership to his peers. Aaron is an extraordinary leader, father, and son, and he truly models that young people are redeemable no matter what they have done. As he states, our mistakes do not define us. Dr. Henrika McCoy is the associate professor at the Steve Hicks School of Social Work. Dr. McCoy's research has focused on strengthening the screening of mental health needs for youth who have juvenile legal system involvement in examining the intersection of mental health and juvenile delinquency, particularly for African-American boys ages 12 to 17. Her work also focuses on the violent experiences of black males ages 18 to 24. Although she is currently a professor, she previously worked as a school social worker, therapist and case manager providing services in a range of with adolescents and their families who were engaged in multiple systems and in need of various supports and services. Jason Clark, First and most important focus is being a father. He is also the director of Northwest Credible Messenger, an organization developed to empower the next generation of black and brown leadership, grown out of his journey overcoming personal and professional adversity. From being a resident of the Washington State Department of Corrections to being a project manager for the largest trial court systems in the state, Jason utilizes his personal and professional experience to develop relationships that produce results and empower others throughout the statewide team to maximize personal and community impact. Welcome today. We're so excited to have you guys here today. So one of, um, one of the discussion starters is I want to start with Erin this morning. Um, and I would like to know, Erin, just a little bit of an update since this last video, you were 19 when this video occurred and you are now 23 and you are still a resident of Green Hill School. So Erin, can you just let me know what you have been up to and also um, if you have seen some of the changes implemented where you are currently today? Yeah, thank you, Evelyn. Um, so yeah, I'm 23 now. Looking at that video, oh my goodness, I was super young. But uh, since then, like you said, uh, I've been, you know, able to work with legislators and lobbyists to, you know, pass some laws that would help our youth over here. And um, one thing that I really appreciate about that work is seeing a lot of the guys who were already in prison, in adult prison, come back because they're able to, you know, under that new law, come and spend, you know, some of their time or even the rest of their time in a juvenile setting. And so that was a blessing. And on, on like just campus over here, you kind of see just like the, the dynamic change. You kind of seen like the energy change around here because 
when I first got here, man, it was just, I kind of learned where Green Hill got his name from. Uh, not Green Hill, but like everyone, you know, just coming up to Green Hill back when I was in my juvenile, people would be like, yeah, bro, it's, it's gladiator school over there. So, you know, being on your 10 toes when you get up there. And so when I first got here, you know, that's how it was. And now seeing it to, to where, you know, it is today, having the guys come back from adult facilities, kind of bringing that maturity to, you know, the campus over here is good because, you know, you got a lot of younger guys here who are coming in at 17, just like me, thinking the same thing as me as like, you know, right when I get to Green Hill, you know, right out the gates, you know, it's, it's funk, you know? And so nowadays, uh, for me, I'm over here in our intake wing, and so I'm the mentor here. So whenever the guys come in here, I'm able to, you know, kind of just tell them like, yeah, so what what do you think about when you were coming here? And they tell me the same thing. You know, I heard it was bad over here. I heard, you know, right when you get here, you know, there's going to be fights. There's going to be, you know, crazy stuff happening. And I get to kind of, you know, tell them like, nah, that's that's not what's going on over here. Let me let me tell you exactly, you know, what is going on. You know, what's the vibe over here? And kind of, you know, just like put a stop to that because when I first got here, it was that. But now when they're getting here, it's different. There's a lot, you know, more things you can do with your time instead of getting into, you know, fights, getting into, you know, smoking weed or whatever, whatever, whatever you want to do over here. We got a lot more programs. Um, and I feel like just from the youth here and even the youth that used to be here, um, for me, I used to look up, I still look up to a lot of the older guys that were here because they kind of were trailblazers in a sense to where when I first got here, my mindset was, you know, fight and, you know, smoke weed. And what they were showing me was like, no, nah, you should get your level four. You should get your, you know, you, you should get your, your level up. You should get, you know, the good things that this place has to offer. And so that was one of the reasons why I kind of just like switched that, you know, thinking in my mind was because of the older guys here. So now that I'm the older guy here, you know, I get to do the same thing. And uh, that's really what I've been up to is really just, you know, helping the younger guys over here. Um, and it's a lot more positive over here and I feel like that's really because us you know older guys over here we're able to kind of set that example we're able to kind of role model for everyone that's coming up here and letting them know like hey man you got you got some years so you know think about what you want to do down the line because if I could go back in time you know I wouldn't have started my time off like I did you know I would have been you know right out the gates getting into programs mm-hmm. kind of just you know building myself and that's really what I've been doing lately is just, uh, or since since then, is just really working on myself, helping other guys out, getting them into, you know, whatever programs I'm a part of. Um, so I'm the chair for the Emerging Leaders Committee, and we're part of uh, the Coalition for Juvenile Justice. So we work with youth all across the country, and, you know, we pretty much collaborate with each other and come up with you know, just ideas that we want to push, um, whatever it is, you know, whatever we're passionate about. So that's what, that's what we do really. And for me, when I first got onto the ELC as a member, it was crazy because I was working with people who had the same passion as me. And even at that time, I didn't really understand just like, you know, what I wanted to do with my life. I just knew that, you know, because someone helped me and I knew that feeling of, you know, being seen and being heard, I was like, you know, why not spread this feeling? You know, why not Why not let everyone else know who's here, who's going through the same thing? Why not let them know, like, hey, bro, like, I see you. You know, I, I understand, especially for, for, for me, it's just, you know, I understand what they've been through because I've been through it. So now working with these guys um, and then on, on top of that, working with a lot of other people from across the country, it's nice to see because in facilities like this, you don't, you don't really see the love, you know? That's one thing that is missing from our system is love. And uh, thinking about that is just like, you know, how can you even grow if you don't have that love and support? Mm-hmm. And so that's one thing that for me, that's like the basis that I work off of is just, all right, you know, like how can I show this this young guy like, you know, that he's loved? 
because a lot of times when they come in, it's just like, you know, they don't feel that. They don't feel that love. That's why their mind is, is, is to fight. That's why their mind is to, you know, cope with drugs. And so I'm thinking, you know, how can I show that love? Because like Evelyn, you know, when we first met, you know, it was all love. And I think that, you know, you definitely changed my life, just changed how I thought, because if I wouldn't have, you know, people like you support me and kind of show me like, hey, like, you're a leader. And you, you, you know, you can, you could, you could really see that, you know, in the, in the living units, you can see that in the day rooms that, you know, people come up to you, people want to talk to you. And at first, you know, I thought that was annoying. Like people come up to me trying to talk to me. I'm like, bro, I don't want to talk to you. Get away from me, bro. Like if I want to talk to you, I'm going to talk to you. If not, just leave me alone. But you kind of let me know like, hey, like these people are coming up to you for a reason. You know, you got something. And so I was like, all right, like, you know, let, let me let me try that. Let me try talking to these guys. Let me try, you know, understanding where they're coming from. And it was a blessing just to kind of open my mind up to that, because now that I, you know, do all this work that I'm doing, you know, I see the effect that it has on on other youth. I see that, you know, other people out there want to help us. They want to, you know, understand our situation. They want to, you know, understand how or what they can do, you know, to help us. And so that that's really like, you know, a blessing is just seeing just kind of that cycle that we, you, you know, it, like we talked about the cycle of, you know, the system. It's just incarceration and death. You know, that's that's really what it is. We see that cycle and, and we try to break that. But kind of building our own cycle instead of just focusing focusing on that cycle is like, all right, let, let, let's create our own system, right? Let's create our own cycle of love and support because we we don't get that. We 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 don't have that. And that's why we end up in systems like this is because we're not, you know, we're not given that. And so now that we, you know, kind of understand that, especially us guys over here, you know, me being the mentor over here, these guys are like, hey, Aaron, bro, how can I how can I get get to be a mentor? Hey, AT, bro, like. What's up? Can you vouch for me to become a mentor? I'm trying to mentor in this way. And now you got, you know, 17 year olds coming in here, not thinking that they want to, you know, get into fights and, and do all this. But really, they're, they're thinking like, hey, man, I like what Aaron's doing. I'm trying I'm trying to do what he's doing. And so, you know, I'm kind of we're kind of, you know, breaking that cycle of death and incarceration. And we're replacing that, you know, with love and support and care. And so, yeah, that's that's what I've been up to lately. So that's his question. Thank you so much, Aaron. Um, yes, you, you're doing amazing work, and we're just so excited to have you here. And just to plug, Aaron's going to be sharing more about his journey and about how to build up youth leadership in the system December 7th next month. So please, please make sure you join that. All right, so now we're going to go into a conversation with all of our panelists today. Um, and this is a conversation amongst themselves, um, and then we can go into our Q&A. So I'm going to start us off um, with a question um, for all of you today. So, so often we see system survivors speak to the harm that has been caused by the incarceration systems. How can those who work within systems take what they hear today to create change? Is that something that can be done when we continually hear and see and research that the incarceration system does not work? And just feel free to jump in panelists. Evelyn, can you say the question again? It was quite complex. Yes, yeah, I'll break it up. So how can those who work within the systems take what they hear from young people or even yourself to create change? And is that something that can be done when we continually hear and see in research that the carceration system does not work? So I'll start off by saying, I think the first thing to remember is that people make up systems. And so we should never look at a system and say it can't change because that means that the people in it are disempowered and people are the most powerful thing in a system. And the reason that they don't change is that we don't recognize or accept the power that we're given to do that. And so what we need to do, in my opinion, is hear what people say and, and 
be honest with what we see. You know, so many times we are so mired in a system that we begin to accept things as normal that should not be normalized ever. And so we no longer pay attention to them. And so if we hear what we're being told and we allow ourselves to be honest about what we're seeing, then we can begin to create the change that we're being told needs to happen and that we know, I think, within our hearts that needs to happen. And that might sound pretty basic and foundational, but I think if we don't start there, we're pretty, we, we won't begin to do anything. So we can't look away. We have to listen. We have to be open and honest and see what role we play in that. You know, just by ignoring things, we're continuing allowing the system to happen as it is. And so we don't consider the, the piece and the role that we play then we certainly can't expect someone else to listen to us and think that what we have to say is important about how a system can change because it sounds pretty hypocritical. Yeah. So I'm going to throw that out there. And of course, you know, I know my um, co-panelists will have other things to say and I'll chime in, but I'm going to say, I think that is the very foundation of where we have to start. I'm going to piggyback off the doc, right? I think um, change starts with us. I think oftentimes it, we look through this lens where it's easy to look out the window and point the finger at what people are doing, but it's hard for us to own our contribution to something, right? And, and when I say contribution, I don't mean, you know, necessarily the dysfunction, but, you know, what if we looked at it as our contribution to reimagining what that could look like? Um, I think change in the system requires um, healing, right? And that's an internal process. But as we work on our own healing, I think it's contagious, right? Anything that we do on ourselves is not going to negatively contribute to um, the things that we're trying to change. And I think in situations like systems, uh, like the doc said, you know, you have to have relationships and, and the humanity to see people for who they are and their ability to change. So I do think that, you know, systems can change. We just have to think and speak and be aspirational in the way that we engage leaders in systems because there's a lot of dynamic leaders in systems, right? So I think that through that, we can create a tipping point for, you know, this incarceration system to be more functional. Erin, do you have anything to add? Good. <laughs> awesome. We'll save that for December. Um, awesome. Thank you guys so much. Um, to kind of go off of that a little bit, um, I so appreciate when you talk about, both of you talked about that we are the system, people are in the system. And so often I had seen that for my own experience of being in the system to work it in the community and then state government and now here um, is that is that the change we wanted to see wasn't necessarily happening because of the policies that have been in place so a lot of those policies we know um, stem from the racism this country has been built on so so with that being said we the people who work in the systems, how do we dismantle those policies? How do we get to the root? Um, because we know that the system is primarily made up of black and brown young people. And we know that the incarceration system in America is today's modern day slavery system. So how do we, again, as the people dismantle, I mean, it, and, and if so, if we can do that, um, who, how do we encourage, you know, how do we encourage the leaders at the top um, to take that? And so often we see that the leaders at the top are white individuals. So how do we, again, continue to dismantle those policies so that we can get the change that we need? So I'm going to give the academic answer to this which I rarely don't do, but it's probably very clear in my mind because I just, just finished um, co-writing a manuscript with some colleagues about this. And I think the first part is understanding where this system started. You know, I don't think people in our country know that the policing and law, law enforcement system we had started with slave patrols and colonial slavery. And they were specifically designed 
to capture both enslaved and non-enslaved black people and put them black on put them on plantations. And that is the fundamental reason why we have a system and why it exists the way that it does today. Because from the very beginning, the whole point has been to incarcerate black people. Now we've now included brown people in, in, um, in that system, but that was the foundation and the reason that it exists. And it's the reason why the laws that we have continue to permeate through those particular communities. And so I think if we aren't honest about that first, we probably are never gonna do anything about it. We have to recognize that our origin is in one place and that as a result, it continues to create laws that continue the very reason that we have a system today. And that's a you know that's like a lofty perspective on it. But I think if we aren't honest about that, then we're never gonna do anything about it. Then I think as we move to a more modern day perspective about it, we have to then think about how those laws are played out in certain communities and not in other communities. You know, I was a clinician, I'm black, I'm from Chicago, I live in a black neighborhood, blah, blah, blah. But the fact is, it doesn't take anyone, um, you don't have to have a lot of experience to be able to see how we treat people with disparate responses. You know, I mean, my work is really focused on mental health and, and violence, particularly for young adolescent black boys. But we know that you'll have two kids in the same courtroom, the only difference is race, and that the other difference becomes the sentence that they get. It's the very same exact thing. If you take away their name and their color, you know, or their race, then you're going to see how those two young people are treated very differently. So, you know, so I gave this kind of academic lofty answer to this about we need to understand why it was created, but we do. Because why it was created is why the laws that we have now continue to pass the way that they do, be allowed to happen, the policies, and then the practices that are implemented, right? We have these policies in place that allow enough loopholes so that the actual practice becomes the result of disparate and disproportionate treatment. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you for that. I see a lot of people in the chat just, you know, praising everything you just said. Yeah, I love when uh when we talk about just like the origins of our of this system, not our system. Never that, but thinking about that, like one thing that I've always thought about is uh when I first got here, you know, our Green Hill shirts, they had a logo that said Green Hill School established in 1889. And I was looking up like, okay, like what else was, you know, made in 1889? And Washington became a state. In 1889, so the, te the 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 year that Washington became a state, you know, they already had in mind, okay, like where are we gonna put, you know, the black and brown kids, you know, where are we gonna put all these bad kids? So thinking about that, it's like they had this idea that they were gonna need, you know, a prison. They were gonna need somewhere to put these bad kids, mm -hmm. and it also gives them a job. So thinking about that, like for me, um, doing the work that we do. It's tricky, especially inside of a, a of a facility. It's like one of uh, so one of my spoken words. I said, I said uh, every time I ask for something, it seems like the people that I'm asking always feel like I'm always asking for something. You know, so that's kind of like the attitude is just like, yeah, yeah. Why are you always asking for something? Like you're always asking for this and that. And so thinking like, okay, like, one, why do I even got to ask for, for help? You know, why, do, why am I not being given that help? And then two, thinking about, okay, this is a job for people. This is what, you know, people get paid for. So it's really not, you know, something that they want to do. Um, not, not saying that there, there, there isn't anybody working in, in the, uh, you know, the facilities that, you know, want to help because there, there always are. But thinking about, you know, when we talk about, you know, people who are higher up, you know, the people that we have to go to to, you know, make these changes and uh, talk to, you think about it, it's like, man, for me or for, for us guys over here, we, we got to go talk to, you know, people that, you know, have shot us down before or, or people that we know, like, man, like, how are we going to ask this? Like, we have to put it in a certain way to make it seem like, you know, hey, this is your idea. It would be great for you. You know, it'd be great to so, you know, make yourself look like that if you help us when really, you know, like, why can't I just ask you, like, hey, this would help us. Yeah. You know, th th this is what we need. Instead of, you know, making this whole entire complex, you know, uh, plan about how to, you know, like plan of action. It's just like, 
why can't we just talk? And, you know, it, it's really comes down to it. It's just like the money. Like if we put, you know, if we, if we were to shut down all the facilities over here, people would be out of jobs. So thinking about that, it's like, man, you know, do we really want to help these guys? You know, do we really want to, you know, give them everything that they're asking for? Do we really want to help them? Because it's so, you know, me and you about to be out of job. We're going to have to find some other, you know, place to work. And, and right now we're making good money. So, and, you know, let, let's give them, you know, sprinkles here and there, you know. So so that's, that's you know, how it works. You know, the truth is. And, uh, you know, how to make a make make like the system, you know, change, um, you know, like reform and, and all that, like. Man, it, it, it's hard to think about because. For me, I want to focus on, you know, just like helping the people that are inside. Mm -hmm. But then like. For me, where, where my heart is, is like, I don't even want to see these guys inside, like, well, I got to help them while they're inside these you know, facilities. Why can't we help them on? You know, on the streets. Why can't we do you know stuff to, you know, really you know help them like outside of a place like this, outside of a punitive system like this, and and going all the way to the top and you know telling these people practically or literally like hey like we don't want you to be working here or, or you know we don't want you to have a job. It's it's hard because. Were you, sorry, were you done, Aaron? I, did you mute yourself? Or... Yeah, my bad. I was just saying this is it's, it's a tricky situation. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I think I think you both touched on um, the context, right? If we're not actually talking about the history, if we're not talking about the things that get in the way. Um, as you mentioned, I've heard that a lot from young people in this system is that we have to ask for the help, but then we hear time and time again that this system is going, is provides you that help, right? And so if we know that these things aren't working, you know, how are we supposed to actually implement that change without people, like you said at the top, either you know getting offended or just not understanding you know there has to there has to be another way and i know that's a whole nother conversation but um i'm really curious uh, jason from your from your own personal experience and then your preference your experience with working in this system your thoughts on this conversation Ooh -wee. um you know, I just think about it in uh, years ago, I created a curriculum around the system, right? And I've seen that uh, Oxford changed the definition since, but if you looked at like the pure definition of system, it's an organized scheme or method, right? And I think when you think of that, it's like, oh, okay, you know, I would challenge that um, systems are not working or that systems are broken. Uh, like, like Aaron said, like, I did some research into the history and I realized that the year our state was created, Green Hill was created, right? So I would say that the systems are working the way that they were designed to, but that's not a functional design anymore, right? Um, I think for me, like looking at history, right? Uh, it, it, it's extremely difficult to challenge systems in a way that um, is disruptive. So one of the things for me that I've learned to do through this process, through being a resident in a system, through working in a system, is thinking of the power of possibility, right? To create something, um, not to say that the system doesn't need to be changed, but I think burning the system down is extremely difficult if you're not thinking about creating. So for me, it's how do you build a house um, without burning this one down, right? And the reality is we know that whatever we're looking at in, in with that's rooted in possibility, aspiration, the agency of our young people is going to work. Um, so for me, I think, you know, how do we change the structure of our system is going back and looking at history, historically what has worked. Um, systems have historically stopped youth led movements, right? The Black Panthers, the Young Lords, the Poor People's Movement, the Chicano Movement. Like if you look at all of these movements, these have been youth-led movements, and I think there's the infinite power of possibility in these young people. 
systems understand that because systems have consistently disrupted those movements. Um, I think we're in a transformative time in our country, right? That it's imperative for us to think about policy versus programs. I think oftentimes in our communities, we look at programs as a way to fix what's happening in systems, but it's the policies that fund the budgets that keep those systems in place. Um, with some of the transformative legislation that's happening by our communities, thinking of the infinite possibility, we're seeing uh, previously incarcerated senators and legislators around the country. Yeah. At some point, Aaron may be one of those legislators, senators. And when you think about the power that he has, right, to reimagine the way that these systems operate, that can create a tipping point for more young people after him. So for me, how do we change the structure of our systems? Um, we have to politicize our young people as early as possible. We have to teach them this process. I mean, you know, we 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 lead a, a politicizing our youth campaign, and the thing that we real the thing that we realize is, in communities of color, there's more people than in the communities that are actually controlling the vote. So we need to organize people to be educated on political processes to vote. Um, I think just reimagining the possibilities and thinking about meaningful relationships, right? Um, when we talk about investing in the next generation of black and brown leaders, oftentimes we're using them as tokens to feed into the machine versus really leaning into their leadership. And I can tell you from being that person who's been tokenized as a young person, as a leader by systems, right? Um, for different movements, initiatives, like it'll be like, this is the transformative thing. And then you look and it's like, no, this is what we've consistently done over the years. Um, I think for me, it's the, the meaningful relationships, right? And I heard love, like what does love look like in our work? Um, I think those meaningful relationships involve an investment of time, an investment of self, and then an investment of resources and opportunities. And we really have to lean into this next generation because as each generation comes, there's more resources, there's more power to the thought process behind them, and we have to invest in that. I think to disrupt, to change, to reimagine what systems are doing. That's powerful. And you, you all three talked about the love um, part of this. And in my own experience, as Aaron mentioned in working with him, there was a lot, a lot of pushback from staff around, um, around, you know, around sharing that love. This system is very punitive to the point that when staff do, especially staff who are black or brown, invest in these young people, it's almost like there's some retaliation that's being done towards that staff person, but also the young people. Um, and so that just really speaks to the policy. Again, the context, do these black and brown children deserve love? And that is a huge question that a lot of us have to ask ourselves. A lot of us that have privileges who work within these systems um, and that is internal work that they all have to do, that we all have to do to really be able to to show love and to actually lead with love to change this system. So thank you for that. So this next um, question is really about thinking about the future. And I know that um, there's a lot of organizations such as No Kids in Prison, Justice for Families, and I'm sure there's plenty more that you all know of that are really taking the lead to shut down these institutions. And I know that that scares a lot of people as, as Aaron mentioned, it's like, oh my, I've heard it too. Like, that's my job. Like we, we need this system or there's just some bad kids out there that, you know, we need to lock up. And what do you do with the ones who, you know, commit these kind of crimes and this and that? Well, it's interesting enough because you do get young people who are Caucasian, who are really, you know, showing the same behaviors, but we send them to treatment facilities. We send them to inpatient. We send them to the, you know, these caring facilities. And so if we have seen that this system in general and that we're facing 
as the people we're facing, you know, these policies that have been built on racism and we haven't been able to dismantle them in the way that we need to. Can all three of you reimagine this country that we could get away from having these, these incarceration facilities as a whole? And if so, what does that look like? What do we do with the young people who are, you know, committing these crimes? I mean, does it start in the community? Um, and I think as Jason mentioned, that that is the answer. It's having the, the community to wrap around. So with all of that, again, can you uh, reimagine this country without these institutions and and what would they look like instead of being incarcerated i mean i think one important thing is that you know we understand and um you know the video talked quite a bit about this why people commit crimes um, you know, we have this tendency in our country to divide them up and lump certain people into certain crime categories and people in other categories that aren't worthy of other things. Um, you know, we know that a significant number of crime is committed, not just for young people, but even for some adults is out of a need, right? A need for medicine, a need for food, a need for something, a need for something that this country is not giving them. And that directly relates to the policies and practices we have where we decide that some people are worthy and some are not, and that we aren't going to give um, the things to people that they deserve to have just quite frankly as a human being. We also have to be honest that we also have a smaller amount of people that commit crimes because of other related issues that may be mental health related, and they need something too, which is mental health services that we're also not giving, yeah. right? And so the crimes that we have are I mean, I'm sure I'm missing something, but are likely all committed because of an unmet need that we are not meeting. And if we start there and figure out what those needs are and then meet those needs, then perhaps we can think about what the system looks like when there is no system. But we have to be honest about how the choices that we're making about which needs we think are worthy and which ones we think are not. And Except the fact that if someone has a need, it is a worthy need because they have it, right? It's just maybe that the answer for how to, to address it may be different than something that we can consider. Yeah. Um, you know, I've, I was a clinician for a while. I've been a professor, you know, just as long. And, you know, I've worked in all kinds of systems. I worked in residential care for youth who were wards of the state, youth who were juvenile sex offenders. I worked in partial mental health. I worked in community-based service. I've done a whole lot as a social worker. And despite, you know, despite being a professor, I'm still a social worker in my heart. That's how I see the world. And there were kids I worked with who it was so clear what they needed, which was a, a, a family who had access and opportunity that they didn't have. And as a result, had choices that they made or someone made for them that got them into whatever system I was working at that time. There were other kids in our juvenile sex offender program. Those kids were wildly different, you know. One kid was in the sex offender program because he was 14 and had sex with a 16 year old girlfriend and because he was the boy and he was, you know, in a state, he was the one who got locked up, right? Even though she was the older kid. You had other kids who were, you know, had been sexually abused for years who then became perpetrators against siblings, et cetera. You had other kids who really had significant mental health problems and probably really should be in some really significant mental health treatment that we certainly were not providing in a residential facility who should not be out without getting mental health treatment. You know, so, but all those kids were in the same program getting the same thing, but those were not all the same needs that they had. We are unwilling to consider how we as a society contributed to each one of those in a different way. So the only way I can imagine the system is that if we are, figure out and recognize what the needs are, recognize that they're not all the same, recognize that they don't all have the same answers, and be willing to then address each of those in a way that allows people to be able to be healthy, functioning, strong, contributing members of our society. Yes, thank you for that. Aaron? Yeah, um, I feel like, like when you say we, like we do recognize that, you know, 
it's the system that needs to recognize that. And and not even that they need to recognize that because, you know, we, before I was even born, you know, people were, were talking about what we're talking about today. So like it comes to a point where it's they're refusing, you know, they're refusing to to to, to hear us. And so like we're talking about, um, you, know, you know, kind of just comparing like if I did something, I, I mean, my, my bro, Jacob Carmichael in the video, me and him had the same charge, but we had two different sentences. And so thinking about how that works, you know, and even coming into the system, being so being a mentor in here, I, I see all the new guys come in and, you know, they, they may be young and, you know, high headed. And especially the black and brown youth who come in here. They're not really given the mental health treatment that they need, right? Because it's not mental health to the system. It's they're just, you know, some bad kids. And so that's that's how, how they kind of, you know, categorize this is that, you know, if, you know, one of my white peers is, you know, dealing with something, you know, oh man, it, it, you know, they're, they're dealing with mental health, you know, they need this, this, this treatment, you know, we need to, you know, come to them. And I'm not saying that's wrong, you know, but I hate to see that when us black and brown kids come in and, you know, we're acting a certain type of way, it's, Oh, let's send them to, you know, let's send them to a restrictive unit. Let's, you know, send them to the hole because, you know, they're, they're acting out they're they're, they're bad kids. Um, even to the point where let's just send them to prison because, you know, we don't want to deal with them. And so thinking about that is just like, why is it, you know, that, that, that us black and brown kids are always, you know, looked at as bad kids and not, you know, youth who need a lot more, you know, support mentally um emotionally because for you know one of my bros he literally had to pick his brother up out of the car because he was shot dead right next to him but when he comes here it's oh man he's getting into fights because you know it's gang related and, and you know all this other stuff but it's like uh do you do, do you know what he's dealing with do you know, you know, the, 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 the stress on his, you know, mental health from seeing that, from having to do that. And so instead of, you know, giving him the mental health support, you know, for, for, for the, the, the trauma that, you know, that he has after experiencing that it's all right, well, you know, he's going to be a gangbanger. He's going to get into fights. He's going to do drugs. So, you know, let's just deem him as a bad kid. Let's even move him to, you know, a unit where, you know, all the other bad kids are right. Let's let's stuff them into a unit, and you know, that's it. And then over here, right, we get. So it, it's funny because we have, we have different like uh, like labels for for di different units, right? So we have open campus, and then we have closed campus. So the closed campus here is, um, the mental health units, and then also uh, the whole which is it's not called the whole anymore but you know it is uh we all know that here but they don't call it the whole anymore and so for the open units right they have different like labels for them so like where i'm at right they call it uh they call it the suburbs so because it's you know there's a lot of structure here it's, it's strict um in a different unit they they kind of call it a I forgot what they called it but it's also another good unit. And then one of the other units here, they call it the hood. And um, obviously that's where all the black and brown kids are. You know, the, the, that's where they're pushing at. Okay, the, this, you know, black or brown youth is getting into fights. You know, he's already been in the two fights since he's been here. So we're gonna move him over there where, you know, all the other black and brown kids are fighting. Mm. And like, I see this and I'm just like, that. <laughs> Andre, yeah, see, he said in the in the comments, put it exactly how it is. They call it the trap. They call it the hood. And that's because the black and brown youth are over there. And it's like nobody wants to work there because, you know, when new staff come in, they're like, oh, yeah, that's a, that's a bad unit, man. Those kids over there are just reckless. They're just, you know, unruly, you know. But for me, it's like, man, have we not watched, like, all these really good movies, like, Gridiron Gang, you know, Freedom Riders, like, you know, 
we don't we don't we don't like want to get these guys over here help instead we just you know make this you know all these rumors between staff and mm -hmm. now staff don't want to work with them now they're not receiving help now they're acting up yeah now they're being sent to the hole now they're being sent to, to, to prison so it's like you know they're not receiving that help and um yeah it's it's crazy how our system does that um especially with mental health because i know you know even for anger management like you know when that stopped being you know you, you know need to be supported you know Gosh, I wish we had more time for this discussion because there's just so much that you said that like ties into, again, this whole question about this system that hasn't been working. I mean, you said these conversations have been being had, you know, before you were born and we're still talking about the same things. And so that's what the hope of this series is how uh, we can make that change. And I'm going to um, transition over since we only have about 16 more minutes. So I just wanna thank all of you. If we can give our panelists a virtual round of applause. <laughs> um, we thank you so much for the work you are doing. We thank you um, for the lives you are impacting and we just honor all that you do. Thank you for being here today. Yeah, and um, um, before we move over to the next part, there is a question from the audience that I'd like to uplift. Um, and it asks, do you think that changing um, the laws at a state level versus um, a federal level is more uh, a faster way to come across an answer or is it vice versa? Do we work federal to state? What are your thoughts on that? So I'm going to say, given our current context related to our politics, that a federal change would be a, a dream and an unlikely thing to happen. So in our current circumstances, things likely have to happen at the state level. You know, in our best scenario of our country working the way it should, we should have things done at the federal level. But I, I mean, I think about how long it took for JJDPA to be reauthorized, which is now called the Juvenile Justice Reform Act. Something as simple as that couldn't even be agreed upon between you know, the Senate and the House. So I think we have to think about states and try to really get our states um, to do the things that we know to happen. And then perhaps the federal laws will change. But I, unfortunately, I don't think the federal way, which would have been a traditional way, is the way that's going to make anything happen. I would agree with that, too. And I think the, the, the most basic example is in our state. Um, when there's a law that's transformed in the juvenile system, it's easier to make a change in the adult system. Um, so I would say it starts at, you know, a state level, but even more than that, like a city, county, state, and then using those examples to try to change state or federal. Awesome. Okay, thank you. So um, we, we're, we have some more activities and solutions and conversations that we'd like to have. I want to pass it over to Tracy. Thank you. And thank you, Evelyn, Henrika, Jason, and Aaron. We are so grateful for your willingness to share both your experiences and your expertise that you've gained. As we think about the information that we've heard them share today, it can be easy to get overwhelmed with all the things that we need to do and that we should do. And if you're like me, you might have a lot of ideas about the big changes that need to occur. And then you start thinking about all the yeah buts, right? Um, like one of the things that we heard is uh, we should really look at what the system is doing. Yeah, but people would lose their jobs. We should do this. Yeah, but the policies would get in the way. And so we might get lost in those yeah, buts. And so what you can see on the screen now is that we, we can't cross the sea if we just stand and stare at the water. And so what we really want to encourage folks to do is identify those specific actions, regardless of how small they are, that any of us can do immediately. Um, Gareth Morgan coined the phrase the 15% solution, and it's to address all those yeah buts. The 15% solution is any first step or solution you can do without anybody else having to approve it, without any additional resources, without any additional money. It's stuff that is entirely within your discretion and your control to act. 
at its heart, it's something that you can start right now, today, to move this project forward. 15% solutions can be really grand, like something that your whole organization can do, or it can be deeply personal. It is something that I will do today. We're about to put a Mentimeter link in the chat. So we're gonna invite you to use your phone or your computer to go to menti.com, that's M-E-N-T-I.com. And you'll see a code in the chat here in just a minute. And you'll enter that code into the chat. And what we're gonna ask you to do is to take a few seconds to just to consider the following. Now we know that justice takes a willingness to take action and it requires us to take small risks and sometimes large risks. So what are you willing to commit to doing in the next 60 days to help your organization or your community shift from locking youth up to lifting youth up? What is your 15% solution? You know, we're gonna ask that you, okay, the, it's in the chat now, go to menti.com, enter that code in the, in the place where you see it, you can add it. And then just take a few seconds to think about out of all the things that crossed your mind today, what is it that you're willing to do and that you will commit to doing? It could be that you're gonna to commit to taking a probation department staff to lunch and talking about what you heard today. It could be that you're gonna learn more about peer support and the role of peer support in juvenile justice. It could be that you're gonna educate yourself on the origins of the correctional system, just like we learned about today and it's how it's rooted in systemic racism. It could be that you're going to recommend that your friends and colleagues register for this series and come back in December. So we're gonna let that go for a few minutes and then we're gonna debrief a few of them. Hey, I'm seeing a lot of really good ones already. Sharing what I learned, using my platforms, advocating for peer support and justice spaces that do, don't have that support already. Awesome. Talking with a local organization who does prison outreach, educating yourself, volunteer work, weekly shift conferences with direct care staff. Oh, that's beautiful. Available to youth in need of mentorship, teaching school staff how to respond to behaviors in a trauma-informed way. All of these are wonderful. What, whatever your 15% solution is. Keep connecting with youth in my circle. Meet more with children and families and listen to their voice. We heard today about the power of um, lived experience and really helping to identify how we can move forward. You know, we, we see and we've heard some amazing commitments and I would invite you to write down your commitment, put it on a post-it note, put it on your computer monitor or on your mirror. And just so that you can remind yourself on the, on the daily, on the regular, what your commitment is to moving this forward. We're gonna be coming back together in December. I think when you registered for this one, it will automatically place the December 6th, I think on your calendar. And we will continue to advance these efforts. I love oh, oh, a fun, enlightening, empowering scavenger hunt. Fabulous. To feel seen, heard, and valued. All of these are so good. So keep them coming. We'll keep this open for a little while while Evelyn helps us close out here in just a minute. Evelyn, I'll turn it back over to you when you're ready. Thank you. I actually think I am going to pass it to Ashley to help close us out. Okay, okay. thank you. We're, we're just passing bottles all over the place, playing volleyball. I love it. <laughs> well, thank you all so much for attending. Before you sign off, there's just a couple of really quick things I want to talk to everyone about. So like Tracy mentioned, when you registered, it should have placed a placeholder on your calendar for the next few sessions that we have. Um, and the next one will be on December the 6th at the same time, same virtual space. We're going to dig in even deeper, have even more conversations about solutions and actions that we can take into our communities. So we hope that you will continue to join us. These series will happen once a month, every month, all the way through April. So we're going to become really good friends. Um, also, we have some upcoming NTAC events. 
uh, upcoming webinar on uh, November 29th. We're gonna drop the registration link in the chat. Uh, we will be talking about dismantling racism and the peer workforce and creating safe spaces for BIPOC peers. So we hope that you will join us for that session as well. Um, and then we are also having a system of care summit. Can somebody do some heart emojis or hand raises if you attended this past year's system of care summit? I see some hearts going up. I, I hope that you all enjoyed it because we're doing it again, uh, May the 10th and May 11th. It's a two day virtual summit. Uh, and on the next slide, you'll see that we are also going to have a call for proposals. So if there's something happening in your community and your organization that you want to share with uh, our intact community, right, and share with uh, everyone across this community, we encourage you to please submit a proposal. Uh, you can visit our website. Uh, it's on the slide here, but we'll also drop it in the chat where you can learn more information about how you can present at our upcoming summit. Uh, even if you decide you don't wanna present, we do hope that you will join us in May. So um, there's information there on our website. We look forward to seeing you there. Um, there will be a survey that we're gonna send, a post survey. Please, please, please help us to continue to build these sessions to be what you need and what you're looking for. So fill out that post survey at the end. We'll share it shortly um, so we can continue to build this community to change really the world. And, and we're excited about that. And then for the folks who uh, have joined and stayed on, there's about 129 people here. Thank you for staying on. What we're gonna do at the end of every session uh, is a raffle for a free copy of the book, Burning Down the House the end of juvenile prison. This is a nationally acclaimed book that digs deeper into the stories about young people who have been abused by the system that was intended to protect and quote unquote rehabilitate them. And it really weaves in reports on innovative programs that are happening all across the nation that are provide effective alternatives to putting um, to putting children behind bars. So if you win the drawing, we will also be inviting you, and we're really excited about this, y'all. We're gonna have a group book discussion with the author, Nell Bernstein, um, where she will talk a little bit more about what's in the book. So um, the winners will be, contact, be contacted via email. So keep an eye on your inbox to see if you've won a copy of the book and also an invite to the group book discussion. So again, I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us today. We're gonna to get to know each other very well over the next few weeks and the next few months. So we'll see you in December and I hope that you have an amazing rest of your day. Take care. <laughs>